I'm, I'm not used to giving one this long. Like, usually they're about 20 minutes or so. Yeah, because, I mean, I guess we do a lot of talks, but, like, research and stuff, so it's yeah. not as limited. <laughs>
Okay. Hello. Welcome to the Explorers Club. It's great to see everybody here in person. Um, my name is Satish Vankatesh. Uh, I'm a member of the Explorers Club 50 and a conservationist. I'm excited for our talk today here about giraffes uh, and to hear the work of uh, David O'Connor, who I'm going to introduce in, in a second. I'm particularly excited because I work a lot with different species, mostly with large mammals. Um, but I actually started some of my work in Kenya when I was 16, working at the Giraffe Center in Nairobi. And it was the first time I'd ever been near some wildlife and able to talk to people in person about it, about that wildlife. And uh, one of the things that first amazed me when I went to feed a giraffe, which their head went from about the top of my head to my waist, uh, was when I went to feed them, their 18-inch tongue shot out and grabbed the food pretty much wrapping up my entire hand. Uh, and David actually reminded me when we were talking earlier today that giraffes are the tallest uh, pollinators, and that's what they use that tongue for as well. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce David O'Connor. David grew up in the Irish countryside uh, with a love of giraffes and wildlife, and that love for wildlife has taken him all around the world from Europe to Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, and Africa. Uh, during his time working, he's worked on different conservation projects for the San Diego Zoo uh, Conservation uh, Research uh, Group, uh, the Smithsonian Institute, National Geographic. He's also served as a member for the IUCN uh, giraffe and a copy specialist group. If you haven't, if you don't know what an copy is, uh, I definitely recommend looking them up because they're a very interesting kind of strange animal. Uh, he's also worked for the IUCN bear specialist group, and has been a board of, on the board of directors for the Giraffe Conservation Foundation. Uh, right now, he serves as the president for the giraffe. Uh, sorry, for Save Giraffe Now, and. Uh, is a research associate for the Smithsonian Institute, along with being a researcher at National Geographic Magazine. Um, and one of the things that's really exciting about David is that about 10 years ago, he got a grant from the Explorers Club uh, to start some of his work working with giraffes in, uh, in Kenya. And it's really exciting to be able to invite him up to talk more about that work and some of the work that he's done since then. Welcome, to David. Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for, for coming here in person and for anyone who may be uh, able to join us uh, over the computers. Um, I really appreciate you all coming out this evening, especially you know during the holiday season and during the, these COVID times. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the, the story of what's happening with giraffe and some of the things we're trying to do to, to help them. Um, First of all, as Satish said, uh, after his very, very kind introduction, um, the Explorers Club did give me my first uh, grant to try to start working on the conservation of giraffe in, in northern Kenya. Um, and if you're ever interested to know how research with giraffe happens, that's what it looks like. Um, you have to take them at eye level, uh, get into their heads. Um, but I very much appreciate uh, the Explorers Club for giving me that opportunity and all the opportunities they've given to so many amazing accomplishments over the years. And again, for allowing me this opportunity to, to speak this evening. As uh, Satish said, I'm President and Chief Conservation Officer of Save Drafts Now. We are a small uh, nonprofit, very much focused, only focused on giraffe. Um, and our, our work is very much, um, we focus on what we can do in the next five years, 10 years to help giraffe. You know, sometimes we can get a little bit bogged down in, in the research and we could research a species to extinction. We're very much focused on impactful projects and also on research that are answering very specific conservation or conservation management uh, questions. So why giraffe? Uh, why are we talking about, about these guys? And um, you know, it, it, it might surprise you that some people call, call them the forgotten megafauna. Um, you know, despite them being sort of so famous in the public con consciousness of, um, you know, you see them in children's books, you see them, um, you know, in, in, on the television, in cartoons. I was in some of the holiday markets yesterday. There were some ornaments with giraffe. So people, you know, really are aware of giraffe. 
but it might surprise people to know how little we know about giraffe compared to how famous they are. For instance, we don't really know with great specificity how many giraffe are left in Africa. We don't really know all the places they live with any great uh, knowledge. We don't know what a home range of a size, size giraffe need. We don't know their seasonal movements. We don't know their migration patterns. We don't know how they communicate. We don't know how they herd. Um, uh, we still don't really know what kind of habitat they, they love the most. And we still don't really know why they have the long neck. And Satish said uh, he would give anyone $1,000 if they could count and tell us how many giraffe are in that photo. <laughs> So to underscore how, how little we know about giraffe, it was only five years ago that we discovered that there are actually four separate species of giraffe, not just one species of giraffe. And each of these species of giraffe are as different from each other as, say, a polar bear is from a brown bear. So genetically speaking, they are extremely different. Um, and that leads into some, some of these issues that I'm going to bring up. So this map here, as you can see, this is, map shows where the four different species live. So the northern giraffe here are these sort of pinkish blobs here. This purple is the reticulated giraffe. Down here is the Maasai giraffe. And on the bottom here is the southern giraffe. Not all of the southern giraffe range are, are, is mapped in this image. There's more here in South Africa, but this is roughly where they live. And to give you a sort of a hint at what I'm going to get into now, this sort of yellowish or tannish area here that is our best estimate based on the existing records of where the range of giraffe 300 years ago. So you can see how much their range has declined over the past 300 years. In fact, over the past 30 years, unfortunately, the story for giraffe isn't great. They've declined by best estimates of 40%. There's actually less than uh, 100,000 giraffe left in Africa, according to current estimates. Uh, to help put that in perspective, um, African elephants across all the continent of Africa, there's about 400,000 of them left. So there's four times as many elephant left in Africa as giraffe. And then when you break it down by species, unfortunately the story is, is a bit harder. Three of the four spe species are endangered or worse. The northern giraffe are critically endangered. As you can see, there's only about 6,000 left. The reticulated and the Maasai are listed as endangered. So why are giraffes struggling? What's, what's happening? Well, some of the reasons for the decline, the main reasons are habitat loss and land degradation. That affects so many of the species across, across the world. Um, you know, when you lose habitat, you lose the space to live, or the existing habitat you have has become degraded due to overgrazing or other reasons. The other issue is more frequent droughts. As climate chaos hits us more and more, we're getting these more frequent droughts. We're dealing with one in northeastern Kenya right now where uh, it's the worst drought they've had in 11 years and thousands of giraffe have died and other wildlife. And we're trying to bring in relief right now, truck in water, truck in food as best we can with the resources we have. The other big issue is illegal poaching. Uh, and that in, in some countries that is really, really hammering giraffe when it's on a commercialized level. So these are sort of the big conservation issues facing uh, giraffe. So what are we doing? Where are we working? So at Save Giraffes Now, we're currently working um, whoops, across nine different countries on over about 20 or 30 projects we have right now. Um, everywhere from Niger, we're supporting work up there, and South Sudan, down through Eastern Africa, and into Southern Africa as well. Um, and how do we sort of work? What's, what's our approach? And you know, everyone often says to me, oh Dave, it's so, so great, you get to work with giraffe every day. They're beautiful, they're tall, they're elegant. You get to watch them every day and, and everything. And, and, and that is true, I am extremely lucky, but actually conservation is not about wildlife. It's about people. If conservation was about wildlife, we would have sorted it out years ago, It'd be no problem. Unfortunately, people are the problem, but they're also the solution. Uh, ultimately, it's the people that will live and work and share their space with giraffe that are ultimately responsible and will, will determine whether those giraffe will live into the future to perpetuity. So that is all our projects are very much focused on being community led and being with uh, local, local people leading the way and investing in building their capacity to try to protect or, or to, to, to look after the, the draft. Our three sort of core areas where we work are sort of, you could 
bunched them under three, three different uh, themes. We have uh, anti-poaching here, which pretty, I think everyone in this audience is, is pretty self-explanatory. We, we fund mobile anti-poaching units across several countries. Not all of them are listed here. Uh, we also fund and help support uh, after the, you know, if a poacher is caught, to work with um, the magistrates and the investigating officers to try to train them up to gather the right evidence and to also be able to prosecute so that the, it's not just a revolving door of, uh, say, a poacher getting community service and being put right back out again. Uh, we work on rewilding and reintroduction, that is bringing giraffe back into areas where they once were but have become extinct, but conditions are good for them to come back again. And then a category called people and giraffe. And this is where a lot of our community-led efforts are, where we have community-led uh, monitoring initiatives to look after the giraffe in their area and to make sure they're safe and to understand uh, that population. We have some research projects, again, that are very conservation-focused, so, such as one outside um, Nairobi in Kenya, where we're looking at uh, giraffe are crossing the Mombasa Highway and getting hammered and getting killed by trucks. So we're looking at if we can identify where those hotspots of giraffe crossing are, and then we can work with the government to put in a wildlife crossing or some signage or bumps or something. Uh, we also work uh, with some other partners on a pretty exciting project to see if we, could, it's, if we can count giraffe from space, from satellites rather than trying to do aerial surveys, which would be pretty amazing in some remote areas, and different projects like that. We have um, also, we have a whole other initiative where we create giraffe rescue centers, where, you know, giraffe calves have become orphaned due to their mother being poached, or for, uh, they've become separated from their mother, or they've, you know, the mother has dried up due to drought and abandoned the, the calf. We have teams that go out and rescue and are able to look after that giraffe, and then re-release it back into the wild to, to a herd again. And we have that now in four countries uh, across Africa uh, and growing. So what I'd like to share with you this evening is sort of two, focus on two more recent operations and projects we have, just to give you a sense of some of the work we're doing. Uh, one is uh, a reintroduction project in Kenya, which I'll talk about at the end. And the other is uh, some work we're doing in, in South Sudan. And I thought this might be appealing for, for this audience because I know the Explorers Club is very much focused on scientific exploration and conservation, and that's sort of what this South Sudan uh, expedition is about. So if this plays, there we go. So this is the approach to Juba, uh, the capital of, of South Sudan. And this will sort of hint at what I say. That if you might see here, you can tell the, the, the city but to me, I was really struck flying in how it blends nearly immediately and seamlessly into what looks like wild, pristine land. And that is a, a story you'll see over and over across um, South Sudan. And we know South Sudan have giraffe. They should have two critically endangered types of giraffe, one on either side of the Nile. But nobody knows anything about the giraffe in South Sudan. Nobody knows where they live. Nobody knows how many are left. And nobody's doing any conservation on giraffe in the entire country of South Sudan. In fact, there's very little conservation effort going into Sudan, primarily because of the, you know, the War of Independence and then the Civil War and the, and the ongoing instability in the region. But what we do know is giraffe are getting killed. Um, you can see here, here's a head of a male giraffe that has been poached. Here is a giraffe tail hair bracelet, and I saw these for sale in the market, $7 each. Um, so we know giraffe are there, and we know they're getting killed. And we saw evidence for carcasses and poached carcasses and things like that. What struck me, though, beyond the bad news of South Sudan, was looking at it, to me, it's of the countries in Africa, it's one of the most potential for conservation. Oh, apologies for that. I've broken the technology. <laughs> So in South Sudan, they, they, there's such potential for conservation because there's so much wild, pristine land without any... If you look at some of those photos I've shown you, you see no roads, no human settlements, no livestock, no pastoralists. So the land is pristine, the habitat is there and ready to go. It's just... A, if we could just save and protect those animals, they, they, would, they would come back, I'm sure of it. But yet, as of now, nobody's investing in that country when it comes to conservation. Thanks very much. I'll try not to break it again. I'm sorry, folks. I did it. <laughs> so 
Sorry, guys. Chat amongst yourselves. <laughs> yeah. You can go past that slide, please, when you put it back on. It was the one with the map there. Yes, please. Thanks, thanks so much. Uh, sorry, sorry, everyone. Um, so when we went to South Sudan to try to look for giraffe and understand what's happening, um, we were immediately focused on this area. And for those of you who are brushed up on your Arabic, you might know that giraffe means giraffe in, in Arabic. So, of course, we zoned in on that, on that area there. And when you look at the county of Fangak, it actually has a giraffe as its county symbol. So I thought, this is the right place. This is where we should go. Um, but unfortunately, it's very hard to get to. So we had to hitch a ride on a UN uh, World Food, Food Program helicopter flying in, one of these big uh, Ukrainian jobbies. Um, so thankfully, they let us fly up with them. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with South Sudan, you may know that the Nile sort of bisects the entire country as it flows up into, into uh, Sudan and into, into um, Egypt. And the area that we're in is, is one of the biggest marshes in Africa called the Sud. And you can see here the, the flooding that happens. Uh, but unfortunately, in the past two years, the flooding has been absolutely uh, dramatic. You can see here where it's flooded into these people's areas, into their houses. And that's meant that the, all these people are displaced in this region. And all their livestock has died because there's no real pasture for them to, to eat. So there's a huge humanitarian crisis actually happening at the same time. In fact, this is Fangak, one of the places, the place we were going to stay. And it's you know, one of the main settlements in the area. Currently, I think, and I'll get this number wrong, but there's something like 40,000 displaced people now have moved into Thangak, but it itself is flooding right now. And in fact, we were meant to land over here in the airstrip, and those of you who can see, uh, you'll see it's flooded. So we couldn't land in the airstrip. We actually had to land in the soccer pitch. And I was absolutely, I thought we were going to blow these houses over when we landed. I thought, I was scared to death. This is not a way to make an entrance <laughs> to a place. So we landed right in the middle of the, the soccer pitch, in the middle of the town. And of course, this, everyone came out to see what was going on, why did a giant helicopter land uh, in, in the middle of our soccer pitch. But thankfully, we met our local team there. Uh, we partnered with a group called ADC uh, out of uh, Fangak. And of course, they, they welcomed us into the compound and had some, some lovely food to, to kick things off. Um, and you know, set us up in, 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 in the area here. This is sort of the compound where we work in. This is the room I was in. Um, so we're kind of ready to go. So we went out and we saw, you know, explored the town a little bit. And you can see here that it's really hard conditions right there now. You know, you can see the flooding. This is a, an open sewer here. You know, people are getting by as best they can with, with food, um, you know, being uh, flown in as, as best it can be and, you know, trying to make the way they can uh, through this. So we knew that the people there were struggling, and of course we have to help. Um, you know, we couldn't turn a blind eye to this. And um, so, working with our local partners, uh, they went out and they surveyed the area. You know, because we don't know, we don't want to go in and say, "Here's help." We don't know what to help them with. So they asked them what they need help with, and it was actually non-food essential items. So the local team found um, 80 households, the most neediest households in that community. And then we were able to, to get some uh, non-food uh, support to them. But we tried to brand everything as coming from giraffe so that people would link that there are some positive benefits to giraffe. This is why people from the outside are coming. They're interested in the, the local people and they're interested in, in the giraffe in the area. So we got things like uh, jerry cans so they can you know, bring water back from the borehole, buckets, uh, mosquito nets, soap, um, mats to, to lay down in. And over the course of two or three days, we distributed the goods amongst the 80 most neediest uh, families and households. And again, we always tried to link it back, back to, to giraffe. Um, and some of them you know, were quite elderly. This gentleman here is being led by his daughter. He's, he's blind, uh, so he doesn't know the fantastic T-shirt we gave him. So I think that's a big shame. Um, and here's, here's another gentleman being, being led away by his daughter. So it was a really, really great sort of connection with, with the local community and to be able to, to help them. So after that, we went out on the Zaraf River and out onto the Nile to explore the area 
to try to understand what's happening with giraffe and how can we best help them. So basically what we did was we tried to go around and meet with local people to understand what was going on. But what struck me as I went through is that the Nile and the Zarafa River and that is very much a lifeline to this country and it's very much still used in a traditional way here. They're harvesting some papyrus uh, to bring it to market. Uh, here are some Noir people uh, bringing their cattle, the few cattle they've left, to swim across to try to find new, new pasture. Um, of course, fishing, traditional fishing is still huge there. Um, and as we go along, we'd ask people, you know, do you see giraffe? Where do you see giraffe? When was the last time you saw them? Are there poachers? Are people killing them? Why are they killing them? Um, and ask them, would they help us? Would they work with us? Would they maybe report, you know, people coming in from the outside? So we spent a lot of time, you know, chatting with people and understanding where roughly the giraffe were and how we could, we could best help them. So now we have our local team in place. Um, and they go out monitoring giraffe. We're, I'm bringing them camera traps and I go back in January and um, you know, to try to document where giraffe are and then we can try to help and bring resources with the local government to fund some anti-poaching rangers to give them some security because that's really the first step in South Sudan. They don't even have the security. All the parks are really paper parks, we call them. There's no anti-poaching parks that people are rangers. But one little snag happened on the way back I want to share with you. Um, the helicopter that was meant to give us a lift home never came. Um, so don't trust a World Food Program helicopter to bring you home. So we had to find another way out, and the only flight we could get was six hours up the Nile uh, by speedboat. So we had to get up at, I think, 3.30 in the morning. The engine didn't work, so that took an hour to fix. Uh, and as we went along, as the dawn rose, we went along the, the Nile, and um, we had to stop, and it kind of brought home to me that this country is still a new country, and it's still very unstable. We had to stop at six different security checkpoints, um, and you know, in very, very remote areas, try to show the right papers, that we had the right stamps. You know, it was a little bit hairy getting up there. But of course, by the time we got there, we missed the flights because of all the security check. So we had to stay the night in, in this place called Malakal. And the only real hotel in town was full. Um, so we had to stay in another hotel, and again, this brought back to me how new this country is and the Im immense suffering and pain it had been through. I mean, this was still, you can see the cracks here from the bombs that were going off when it was artilleried. Um, what also struck me here is these were children's drawings on the walls, and you know, it's all to do with the war and, 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 and um, you know, those, those, those war machines, basically. And this was the airport. Uh, Malakal Airport, and you can see they still haven't had the opportunity to fix it up yet, uh, and it's full of bullet holes and things like that. But thankfully, we were able to, to get out safely and got home, um, and I'm looking forward to be able to go back in, in January to try to build on this initial work that, that we started, which is still really quite young, but I, I have a lot of hope for, for this if, if the situation continues to stabilize there. So what I'd like to spend sort of the, the, the second part of the, the talk about is, is this reintroduction work we did in Kenya. And I'd like, if it plays, to start with a video as kind of a teaser to let you know what we're, what we're going to be talking about. So hopefully, fingers crossed everyone, this will work. Uh, but I'm, I lied, we're not going to do the video yet. Sorry. Um, I want to tell you what a reintroduction is and why it's needed. Um, so if you look at this map here, this is a map of the continent of Africa, and up here you can see these kind of yellow areas here. And what it reminds me of is an archipelago of islands. And that is the remaining range of the northern giraffe species. This yellow line out here is our best guess of what it was like 300 years ago. And when it comes to the northern giraffe species especially, is these are all isolated populations. They can't connect. So these giraffe cannot go to here, and they can't expand their range. So if we want to bring giraffe, expand their range, we literally have to capture them and put them in a truck and re-release them in an area that they used to be, that we know they can live in, and that is now secure. And that's sort of what we do uh, across several countries, but this is the one we're going to talk about in, in Kenya.
Liberty and Gems. Two groups of people that were formerly at war with each other coming together and saying we must protect these last drought. Giraffe brought to us peace. And the peace has also given an opportunity for the wildlife to thrive back. because we know it, it struggles um, and I can fill in the rest of the story. So the one with the, the math there, please. Sixty-six, please. This one? That guy. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Th thanks, everyone, for, for bearing with us, and, and thank you for fixing it. So this area here, as you can see, um, what, what, what that video is introducing you to is this project we've had in, um, in Lake Baringo in western Kenya. And what's happened with the giraffe in, in this area is that in Lake Baringo, that was the core range of the Rothschilds or the Nubian giraffe, um, which is a subspecies. And there's probably only about 800 uh, Rothschilds giraffe left in, in Kenya. Only about 2,000 left in the world. Um, and what happened here is that in this area, this would have been a core of their range, but they became extinct there about 70 years ago. And the two communities that had formerly been warring, the, uh, the Njemp and the, and, the, and the Pokot, they came together and they formed the Ruko Community Wildlife Conservancy. They decided to, to stop fighting. Let's see if we can try to have peace, because war has brought us nothing of any value. And they, they wanted to bring their giraffe back. They knew they had had giraffe in the past. They hadn't had them today. So they were, wanted to bring them back. And they, what they did was they were able to get eight giraffe, some of which came from the giraffe center, actually, um, and were able to release them in a peninsula that went out into the lake because they figured, okay, wisely, they said, you know, three sides are water, so you really only have to protect one side from the poachers that would come in and try to kill them. But unfortunately, and they brought those eight giraffe in, but unfortunately the lake had other ideas. And in the subsequent years, it rose by about 50 feet. And they actually converted that peninsula into the island you see here today. And that is where these giraffe have been stuck ever since. Uh, these eight giraffe on this tiny, tiny island. And those of you who know giraffe, you may know they're not the best swimmers. In fact, they're not swimmers at all. So these giraffe were trapped on this island. And the bad thing is, especially in the dry season, you can see here, there's absolutely no food. Um, so the community had to supplementary feed these giraffe during the dry season uh, to try to keep them alive, which was a huge burden on, on the community. But they, they, they wanted to do it. They wanted to save these giraffe. And um, the giraffe themselves weren't in great condition because they weren't getting the proper um, nutrients because it was a very limited diet. They were very thin. They had a high parasite load. So I started going there a few years ago to try to work with the community. How could we maybe try to get these giraffe off the island and rescue them? And so we made a plan uh, that we were going to create a draft sanctuary on the mainland. So you can see here, this is Lake Baringo. This little island here, that's the giraffe island where the, the giraffe are trapped. So with the Ruko community, Ruko, within the Ruko Conservancy, we created this draft sanctuary here of about 4,000 acres. The whole conservancy is about 40,000 acres. And we, were, we wanted to fence one side of it here to keep out poachers and also livestock, because we we're going to keep that as a wildlife area, um, and also so that giraffe wouldn't go too, too far away so the rangers could keep an eye on them, because that's plenty of room for a giraffe. 
And then the, the walls of the, the Rift Valley and the, the lake were sort of the other boundaries to it. But now we had another problem. How do you get giraffe off an island across a mile of lake when they don't swim? So we had to try to build a raft. And I am not an engineer and I don't know how to build a raft. But the local guys, they knew and they were able to make a raft themselves. And these are all old oil drums that have been welded together, 60 of them. They built a frame in the bottom and they were starting to build, build out the, 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 the raft, which is, to me, incredible. It just shows the amount of talent and um, skill that, that is there once they have the resources. Um, but then um, the lake level started rising even more rapidly in the past two years, so we really had to accelerate this project. And in, it was last year that we really, Save Draft Now, really pushed in a lot of resources to try to get these giraffes off the island. So we then thought about, okay, how do we get these giraffes onto the boat? We have the boat, the giraffe aren't sailors, how are we going to tempt them on? Well, we had a small trick up our sleeve because Mike here, as you can see, the giraffe whisperer, look at them all following him, like a Pied Piper. And I think we all know why, because there's food. So that's what we thought, let's try to tempt them on with food. Um, because, you know, they'll go bananas for food, and that just goes to Satish's point here, you can see the size of the giraffe uh, there, when you're up close to them. And it was actually working. You can see this is the, I believe, the male. We'd move the, the, the food closer and closer. He's getting more and more interested in, in, in the raft. Uh, but then, of course, nature had put another challenge in our way. It started to rain again, and the whole place went green. And so now they have plenty of food, so they're not interested in our crummy food. <laughs> they're like, okay, you're going to make it hard for us. So then we decided the, the lake levels were rising really rapidly. We got a call in November that um, the, lake, the island had actually split in two, and one giraffe had been stuck alone on a very, very low-lying part of the island that was maybe only a hundred less than a football field's width, very, very low. She had lost her calf to, um, I believe it was a crocodile attack, um, and the waters were rising, 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 so she was going to get flooded. So we knew we had to get her off the island, and that was that, the name of that giraffe that the locals gave was a Siwa, uh, that was mentioned briefly in that video. So we got with the Kenya Wildlife Service, with Northern Rangers Trust, with the wildlife vets, how are we going to get these giraffes off the island? And it was decided we have to go ahead and dart them. Now, when it comes to giraffes, those of you familiar, uh, if you uh, tranquilize, say, a rhino or an elephant or something, you shoot the dart, the dart hits, they fall over and they go to sleep. Easy peasy. Giraffe, of course, are not so easy because they have very, very unique physiology given their shape. You know, they have to pump blood from their feet, 19 feet up to their head. Uh, they have to regulate that blood pressure. So when they're on their side, they don't do well at all because the blood pressure can be so, so high uh, that they're basically their brains could explode or they have a, you know, a huge aneurysm. Or they could choke on their saliva. So it's very, very dangerous to tranquilize a giraffe and very challenging. Um, and we had to bear that in mind. And sometimes when you dart a giraffe too, again, they don't just fall asleep. Some of them, due to a physiological response, and you'd have to ask a vet what happens, but something about their physiology, some of them run. And it's amazing, you'll see them, they'll go and they put their head back up like this and they kind of run blindly um, into you know, wherever they're going. So that can be a big challenge. So when we, 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 we got ready, and we're getting ready to move a Siwa, our first big, big move. And I don't know what you can see here, we've kind of cleared this area out here. And what we'd hoped to do with the Siwa was build a temporary sort of enclosure near the barge, the raft here, dart her there. Hopefully she'd fall asleep in there and we could just quickly walk her on. Well, she was having none of coming into that area. She was not interested in going into that area at all. So, it's okay. So we knew we had to go out and get her. So she was hiding in the area of thick sort of brush on the island. But the vets, I mean, they're so experienced. They went, they got the dart in, um, and it was quite challenging because you can't really see through the thick brush and like this giraffe would come looming and then go this way. But of course she started to run. And this was a big challenge. You know, we all had to run through the brush because you didn't want to lose sight of her because when she fell over, you need to be there. And she started running straight towards the lake and she decided to fall over, thankfully about a foot before the, she hit the lake, because if she'd gone in the lake, that would have been a big problem. 
But she managed to run to the exact furthest part away from the barge. Um, so we got there. I remember I was the first there. I, I got onto the head to try to control her, you know, so she wouldn't try to get up. And I remember uh, the vet came in and he basically tackled me out, out of the way to get the reversal drug straight in so that she would start recovering. Because remember, those giraffes don't do well when they're on the side. So while we were doing that, while she was sort of waking up, then we put the hood on. We put... Um, some earmuffs in, we actually had to get, we forgot the earmuffs, believe us, so we had to get some guys' socks and put them in. Um, and then we attached the guide ropes, two around her shoulder, and then a light sort of head harness on her head. But what you can see here is look how thick it is. And how are we going to walk her now? She's 19 feet tall, there's no trails in this area. You know, how are we going to get her head under this? So we had to chop down some brush and all this. All of this is why she's waking up. And you can see sometimes, you know, she thinks we're predators. So, of course, she's going to kick sometimes and freak out. You know, I would, too, if I was blindfolded and a bunch of dudes jumped on top of me. So we were trying our best, you know, to keep her calm and get her walking. But thankfully, we managed to, to get her, you know, moving. And once she hit a trail that she knew, it was unbelievable. She totally changed her demeanor. And she just walked like I, I think you would see some of the dogs walking in, in Central Park. Just walked easy peasy right on to the barge. Um, and at this point, we decided that both didn't have a name. So at this point, we decided to call it the giraffe. Um, and what I was amazed about was the sea where once she was on there, she was so calm. I thought she might be kicking, or I was really worried about that, her kicking and all that. But she was really calm. She was a really, really great sailor. She was so cool. We were, you know, shooting the breeze. I remember some of the guys, uh, some of the... Um, guys were helping us catch her, they were like, oh, we should have brought some tea for this journey. You know, because <laughs> it was so calm, it was really nice. Um, and then we, we sailed about a, across about a mile of the lake and um, made it to the mainland. And it took about an hour or so. And again, what was incredible, she didn't run off, as you may often have seen an animal that's been released. She, didn't, she just walked off. And I looked around as if she owned the place and just walked very stately into the, into the brush. But what I love about this photo is this is the first time a giraffe has set foot in the Western Rift Valley of Kenya in 70 years. Um, and that was pretty amazing. And what was really amazing was the community's response. I mean, they all erupted in joy. They had put so much into this. They had risked so much coming together. This was, you know, they all had so much hope. Everyone was so worried something would go wrong with this giraffe. Because if we failed on this first one, the whole operation would have been shut down. And thankfully, she was fine. Nobody was injured. And, you know, it was just an amazing eruption of joy in that community. You know, their, their plan had come together. And now their future is looking a lot brighter. So then we carried on um, uh, moving the other giraffe. And thankfully, uh, we took a bit of a break after Siwa because she was the, the one that was in most dire need with that low-lying island. So we said, okay, let's break a little bit for a few weeks and see if we can train them on, oops, see if we can train them on with food. Um, and it worked. This is the male. He worked. He was getting on, no problem, no hood, no nothing, no chasing through the brush and getting, you know, cut up by acacia thorns. And it was amazing. It worked. And he went off and he, uh, what was incredible about him, he fed the entire way across, you know, the greedy guy that he is. He fed totally across the entire way of the, of the journey. Um, and so that, it was slowly by slowly we then went and brought over all of the eight giraffe, um, one by one. Some of them we did have to dart still because uh, they were just too shy or, or too nervous. Um, but uh, we were able to slowly go th go through them and, and bring them up, bring them bring them home. So let's see. Below that. Yeah, keep going, please. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Uh, that that one there that's blacked out because I won't show that other video. It'll break again. So this this one here. No, this one. Yeah. Put one more. One more, please. Oh. Ah, thank you. 
Okay, hopefully this will. Okay, good. No, that worked. Okay, so that little cast I barely showed you because I want to break it again. <laughs> so they had one more surprise on their sleeve for us, these giraffe. So we started with eight. And then just before, in the holiday time uh, last year, uh, one of the giraffes that we didn't know was pregnant and had a calf. So we started with eight and then there was nine. And the community named that calf Noel, I think after the, the season. But that calf was the very last one we took off the, the island. Uh, her and the mother we took off at the very last because we wanted them kind of to be close together. But we did it. We were able to get all nine giraffe off, reintroduce them uh, after 70 years. So it was, it was pretty, uh, a pretty wonderful, wonderful thing. And then last month, I just went back to visit our team and, and our partners to see how things are going. So I met up with Mike, the, the, the giraffe whisperer. We had a few laughs. Uh, and we went out and see, to see how the herd are doing. It had been about, you know, with the last one, it was about, you know, maybe six months or more since we'd gone back. And look at them now. They're, they're out there. They're thriving. They've moved away from the landing area. They look, what I saw, like all of us after COVID, they look so fat, so fat, so happy. They're getting good food. Their tick load is down. They're doing, doing really, really well. So now our plan is, hopefully, later this year, we're going to bring in about another 20 of these endangered giraffe to try to, 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 to form a bigger herd here. And that will form the core of a breeding population that we hope will breed up naturally. And then as the population gets a bit bigger and the conditions are, are right and security is right, we're going to drop the fence. And then slowly, over time, we hope these giraffe will slowly repopulate westwards through the community conservancies that we're already talking with. Uh, and we might do some supplemental introductions along the way, all the way over to Uganda to meet their cousins uh, on, the, on, the, on the coast there. So maybe I'll come back in 20 or 30 years and um, hopefully I can tell a happy story of how we brought them and met their, 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 their cousins. Um, but with that, I've taken enough of your time and thank you all so much. I just want to reiterate that... Um, Thank you. That, you know, the focus of our work, as maybe I've tried to highlight, is now. It's not later. We're trying to save giraffe now. Um, so, again, thank you all so much. Please feel free to contact me or yeah, um, anything in the future. And thank you again. Should I bring this? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, David. It was amazing hearing your story and um, it's great ending on that success story and hopeful future for this uh, group of giraffes. Uh, we're going to take a few questions now. Um, we'll, what time is it now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we'll take a few questions now. I just want to make sure that we kind of keep these questions kind of short so we can get around and try and get as many people as we can. And then... Um, Hi, David, thank you. What an incredible presentation. In terms of your rewilding project, because this is fairly new, you've got this core group of eight. You're going to introduce them. The plan, right, is to have them get with other giraffes. From your observations, is that an easy thing to do? I know with gorillas and chimpanzees, you have to find the right family fit. What is it like with giraffes? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question, and um, you're right. And it's similar with, with elephants because we have those maternal lines that are very, very solid and stable. Again, we don't know all that much about giraffe. What we do know is we think they don't form sort of stable long-term herds the way, say, elephants do. What we see them doing is they have a sort of a herding technique called fission fusion, where if you watch a group of giraffe for any length of time in the wild, say there's 10 giraffe, at some point two might wander off and then another two might join from something else. So they kind of have this fluid interaction where they're forming groups and then they're disassociating. And we don't really know why that happens yet. Maybe if we partner with you, you can answer some of those questions for us with your behavioral knowledge. But um, so we think there probably are some longer term bonds or some closer bonds between individuals. But based on some other reintroductions that have happened, and very few have happened, but some others, that, that hasn't been a problem of reintegrating giraffe. And we found that with orphans, too, which, which, is, which is good. Um, so that's sort of our, our hope for the future, yeah. 
Uh, thank you, David. That was very uplifting. Um, th this topic is very, you know, uh, but um, you listed four categories why we're losing these giraffes. Um, maybe a fifth one would be trophy hunting. Mm. Uh, you didn't address that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, Cecil, when, when Cecil was killed by, by that dentist, uh, nobody knew, I mean, very few people knew that lions were hunted. Yeah. And, um, and I'm just back from s Southern Africa, and I physically saw 50 giraffes that had been shot by trophy mm. hunters. Mm. And yes, it's been legally, they've been shot for fun. Mm. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, to get my head around of, of anybody that would shoot a giraffe, I always said, like, shooting a giraffe, you might as well go and shoot a beautiful woman. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, one hunter told me he shoots giraffe because he likes the sound when they fall. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great point and, and thank you for raising it and, and, and bringing it up and you're right, as of now, trophy hunting is legal in four African countries and you're right, it should be an issue that is addressed and talked about. Um, unfortunately, with Save Giraffes now, th those are the areas that we kind of focus on um, with the capacity that we have as, as a small organization and we know that there are other groups that are focused on the trophy hunting. Um, but thank you for bringing that up because that is a, an issue that should be should be brought up in this context. Yeah. Okay. So another question. So why do they poach them for their? Oh, sorry. Oh, why do they poach them for their skins for their yeah, that, heads? Why? Yeah, that that's a good question. It's slightly different to maybe the story you've heard with illegal poaching for say elephants and rhino. So it's not for an external market that's looking for for parts of the animal. What's happened is it's mostly for meat, but also for some parts, as you saw with the, the bracelets there, and there are some trophies depending on the tribe or the country that you're in. And the big problem when it comes with poaching is that it's, it's when it's commercialized. And in some of the places that we work, I, I won't tell you the exact places, but maybe you can guess, we're working with some groups in an area where Al-Shabaab is very, very active. I was just there myself last month, and they're a, a, a terrorist group affiliated with ISIS. Um, and they are a uh, hammering giraffe, and they are very efficient at it. They, in fact, they've, and excuse me, I don't want to upset anyone, but they've modified how they uh, kill giraffe now. They, they've sort of modified machetes, and they take what they call boda bodas or motorbikes out, and all they have to do is slit the back of the, the leg of a giraffe and sort of cut its tendon, and the giraffe kind of go over, and then they, they kill it, and they can clean a carcass, I'm told, in about 20 minutes. And they might send a team of 25 people out, different motorbikes, and it's a very, very slick operation. Then they bring in a refrigerated meat truck, like you'd see here. They just fill the, the meat in, and then th that goes to the markets in the big towns. And usually it's not even sold as giraffe. It's sold as just meat, uh, nomachoma or something like that. And so it depends where you are, why, but largely the big issue comes is when it's commercialized in that way. Um, we do have a project, we obviously are addressing the, the anti-poaching side of it as best we could, but we also have a, a project that we're helping fund uh, in doing, there's uh, secret shoppers going to these markets, buying the, the meat and then testing it genetically so we can then say this is giraffe, this is kudu, this is cattle, and then we can trace, they can actually trace that back to what part of the countries that came from, and then we hopefully can get through to the middle people and you know the higher up people that are funding this and organizing it, because I think that's when we can really, really put, put, put a stop to it. In, in Tattoo Down, it's a bit different. It was for the, the tail hair, as you saw, and they were selling them seven bucks a pop. So it depends what, where you are. And you can imagine if you're, if you're hunting, you know, bush meat, you know, a giraffe is, you know, a ton and a half, a ton of meat. So it's a big amount of meat for a bullet or, or a snare or, or, you know, something like that. What's the uh, origin of the giraffe? Where does it uh, anthropologically come from? Right, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a really good question. It is an ungulate, so it comes from, from that line, a sort of, and it's an even-toed ungulate, so it comes from, from that sort of heritage, but it's split off a long, long time ago. So much so that it's, it, it, its closest relative is the okapi that uh, Satish mentioned, and those of you who 
may be familiar with it or maybe look it up. It, it's a very, as you said, funny looking, not funny looking, but strange looking, unique looking animal that the, the rump of it kind of looks like a zebra and the front of it looks like a giraffe. And I'm so glad I don't study okapi because they live in dense tropical forests. I joke with some of my colleagues that some of them have studied them for 20 years, but they've never seen them because they're so secretive. Uh, so they just study them by hoof prints or camera traps or things like that. Yeah, so they're very, very unique lineage uh, all on their own. Um, thank you very much and uh, great story. Thank you. It's a complex issue. I lived in Rwanda for a couple years and talking to the people that, you know, helped set up the mountain gorilla preserves, the key was to demonstrate to the local population that the animals were worth more alive than dead. Yeah, yeah. How are you, in, in you know, trophy hunting is another way that, that that's done, is those cost a lot to go shoot one of those, and then that money goes back for conservation. I don't think it's the best way to fund it. With these reserves you're moving into now, are what's the model for, for like, yeah. Monetizing that so that the locals actually are benefiting from it and see the animals mm -hmm. worth more alive than dead. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and that's also why we largely work outside of national parks on these community conservancies, because usually in national parks there aren't people. Um, so we focus mostly on, on these areas outside. So in the community conservancy there, for instance, that land had nothing. There was no income, there was no jobs, there was no source of anything. So we're helping fund not only the creation of that conservancy, which then comes with jobs in terms of funding the anti-poaching rangers, funding the management staff, funding the, the, the livestock um, people to manage the, the livestock. They've all agreed to manage the livestock there better. Um, so that is another source of income that they can actually get better prices for their, for their uh, livestock. And then we're also help, help fund through conservation fees and through other means, then the creation of clinics, the creation of schools, so that there's very tangible, as you say, benefits to these wildlife, giraffe in the case of Ruko, uh, so that they, they can see and they can feel it. They're sharing their space with these giants, which is a pain. I mean, could you imagine if elephants were walking around, you know, here? I mean, people wouldn't deal with it, you know, but they have said we are, we are willing to share the space with these giants, and sometimes it's a pain. And so you're right, they have to have these tangible benefits. And that's also the case in South Sudan, as you saw. We immediately, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a split community effort and wildlife effort, which is kind of a, as it should be, uh, in terms of these people are, are sharing their space with giraffe, they're the custodians of the giraffe, and they, they should be able to try to, to get benefits from it. But unfortunately with conservation, we're, we don't, we're very young in this game. We're not business people. We're not ways to, to find out innovative ways to monetize. So I'd love to chat with anybody who has ideas around that because we, our training isn't in that. You know, I'd make a very poor entrepreneur. I have no nose for profit. So. <laughs> Again, thank you, David. It was awesome you. talk. Um, seems that these are small, you know, continually like shrinking sub populations, especially I think he says around eight on the island. Have mm. you seen like problems with and or are there ways to mitigate like inbreeding in these smaller groups? Right, yeah. So that is a very as you say, a very, very small group. And to make things even worse there's only one male. So that would definitely be an issue. And that's why we're bringing in those those twenty giraffe. Yeah. Because you need to have that, you know, enough diversity to to, to obviously build a healthy population. Um, we don't know greatly what's the minimum number of giraffe and the ratio of men to fem females to have, but based on the evidence that we've seen in some small populations, even a diverse group as small as 30 can have enough diversity to, to go forward. Um, but the key is is to bring in, as we, we are with those other ones, so you're 100% you're right, you can't just reintroduce four giraffe and leave it at that. You have to have the resources before you even begin to bring in enough that you're, you know, you can create a genetic, genetically diverse population that can then expand. Hi, this was so Hi. great. Thank you for sharing this. Oh, I'm just thanks. wondering, what's your favorite thing about giraffes? Oh my gosh, I have a lot of favorite. How long do you have? Um, no, I, I like a lot of things about them. Um, two things I'll tell you. I like that they're sort of strong but silent. So people often call them the gentle giants, and they are, but if you mess with them, they're going to 
they can kill a they can kill a lion with a kick. Um, and they've broken my ribs actually kicking me. Um, so I love that they're sort of the strong silent type. And they'll always beat you in a staring competition. You'll never beat them. So. This may be a bit niche, but you mentioned the parasites. So I was just wondering, do you vaccinate the giraffes? Or like, what is the care for them like in terms of infectious disease? And then also you mentioned um, the, the food, that guy with the pack. What do you feed them when they don't have enough um, green stuff? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, as of now, we, we don't have the resources, and I don't think anyone is treating the giraffe for parasites or anything like that. Um, there is a big issue that uh, you brought up, that there is, seems to be this giraffe skin disease that's happening across many parts of, of Africa and many populations. It kind of looks like mange. Uh, and there are some veterinarians and, and people researching the causes of that and how to cure it, and does it affect mortality? But in the case of the, the eight giraffe, our friends from the island, that was just naturally. They became healthier themselves, uh, and the tick load went down. And I think also on the island, they were the only game in town for the ticks. You know, there was nowhere else for them to feed, at least here, the ticks have other animals that they can, they can uh, latch on to. Um, yeah, did that, that, sorry, I forgot the second part. Oh, yeah, the food, yes, that's it. So what uh, they were feeding them because of what they could get were the uh, basically lucerne, if you know what lucerne is, pellets. It's a type of uh, grass. Um, sometimes they feed them horse pellets, which isn't great for giraffe, but uh, obviously they can survive on it. In the area where we have the drought relief uh, that we're doing in northeast Kenya, the, the food that we're trying to get is first we've, tried, we've hired 600 local people to go out and collect acacia seed pods which are the seeds of the acacia tree, which are like crack for giraffe. They go bonkers for it. So they've been surviving on that. Um, and then we've also used some of those lucerne and alfalfa pellets. We tried kale, and the giraffe would not survive in California. They didn't go for the kale at all. They weren't digging that. So, But we're still learning what they, we've called. We've called a lot of zoos to ask for help and try to, to come up with a good feed solution. Oh, yeah. What brought your attention to giraffe conservation? Was there like a particular moment? Yeah. Uh, funny you should ask. There, there actually was. And it came when I was uh, funded by the Explorers Club. And at the time, I was just doing research. It was going to be looking at how giraffe and camels feed and do they compete because camels can also feed up quite high and they're becoming more popular as livestock. But I remember distinctly, I was out in the field walking to one of to to go to try to do my observations and I turned around the corner and something hit my neck like that and it turned out it was this huge noose made of uh, wire it was a neck snare for a giraffe that that I walked into and I didn't know what that was at the time um, but at that moment I then started looking and learning more and back then nobody really nobody was no, doing anything with giraffe and that's what sort of gave me the hint that these guys are are in trouble yeah. My yeah. question is during the lecture you uh, talk, uh, uh, you mentioned a couple of times about two uh, different kinds of giraffes. Mm -hmm. Do they live in different places of different countries? So on what way they are similar and what the way they are different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard to tell giraffe species different just by looking at them. They are very, if you look at them side by side, their coat patterns are very different. So a Maasai giraffe, for instance, their patches are very rough, like they kind of look like serrated, whereas a, a reticulated, their blocks are smooth. So you can tell by their, by their coat pattern. Some of the other ways is that the number of ossicones or horns they have on their head. Some species only have two, some have five. So it depends, again, on, on the type and, and sex of the giraffe. And then you can also, some of the giraffe's builds are different. So the ones that live in Niger, um, they live in the Sahal region, they're much skinnier uh, and they're a little bit smaller, you know, they're more sort of nimble and, and agile that way. And then you look at something like a, a Maasai giraffe, that's a beefy, you know, giraffe. So there are ways, but most, the, the most ways that meaningful wise when it comes to preserving the biodiversity of giraffe came from the genetics.
Uh, I had a couple of questions, too. So, oh, God, uh, here comes the hard ones. No, these are pretty easy. <laughs> uh, one is just, in general, we don't know a lot about draft communication, I think. Right. Um, does that kind of hinder how you look at, like, conserving them or kind of integrating different populations or individuals Yeah. And how they communicate? Yes, it, 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 it does. We wish we knew, we knew more. Um, giraffes don't vocalize at all in the wild. They're very silent. Sometimes they will, and it's kind of like a, I don't know, a kind of a growl in a way. It's very strange. Um, but they don't talk much that we can hear. There is some evidence that they might be communicating beyond the range of human hearing. Um, there was some research done in zoos where a giraffe are humming to each other. They seem to hum somehow. Again, this is all we don't really know uh, much about it. But when you watch a herd of giraffe, they are definitely communicating somehow because they will coordinate their movements. They're, they're somehow communi communicating to each other. They're not just operating blindly, you know. So, um, yeah, that's going to be a fascinating area of research in the years to come. And, of course, that affects how we, how we handle them, how we, you know, manage them, how we move them, if we have to do a re reintroduction, things like that. Yes, and it goes into your silent extinction. Exactly. Well. They're yeah. not making much noise about Ex it Right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then the other question I had is, like, what what did you learn from doing this, like, small reintroduction that mm -hmm. kind of would was, like, new and you didn't really expect it, mm -hmm. but they could be kind of replicated in other areas? Yeah, um, that's a, a very insightful question. That I would say the main one actually comes to the mechanics of the move itself. Um, because as I mentioned, and those of you who have been out and maybe seen it, they don't do well when they're tranquilized. It's very stressful. And giraffe have been lost. Thanks, Lev. I haven't seen one, but, you know, when they've tried to move them. And you don't want that. You're trying to – these A, there's few of these giraffe, and, you know, we're trying to move them to give them a better life. But you weigh the risks, and you do everything you can to protect it. But what we learned was that you can tempt a giraffe onto a, a, a human structure using food or behavior or something. So we're actually going to try to fund a study – to see if there are ways that we can, in a, in a wild setting, attract giraffe into an area to minimize the need for, for tranquilizing them or darting them. Um, and we're also going to look at often giraffe that are transported in areas where the tra countries where they're transported a lot, say, say South Africa, for instance. When they get off the ramp or they, they walk off, they often can sometimes break their leg because they go off the side of the ramp. So we're also going to look at the design of the ramp as well. And the last thing that we learned was that some of the giraffe that we actually darted and had to walk on did better without the hood because uh, we thought the hood, you know, with the horse or something, it calms the animal, they would do it, and we just thought, but then we tried one without, and the animal was even more calm. So those are some of the things, yeah. It's a very early. We're learning so much. Very amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah. The swelling of the of their knees. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. We it kind of baffled, and I asked a few people, and we, there's nobody gave, me, gave yeah. us an answer. But it definitely looked like it was some kind of infection. Really? Was it males or uh, both sexes? Or I think it was. I, I, it was quite. A, it's quite a while back, so I can't, okay. I can't remember. Yeah, because the one thought that came to my head, if it was just males, it could be injuries from fighting, because the males fight. But maybe it doesn't sound like it was that. It was more like, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't know that, but that's interesting. I'll, I will ask. We have colleagues who actually work in Roja, so I'll ask them about that. That's, that's good. Um, yeah. So we're, we're in this pandemic. How has this affected the giraffes you're working with and the people that you're working with over there? I know Kenya, you know, because they've lost so much of the – not that there's big tourism where you're working, but it, it's affected – people all over the world. Mm -hmm. What yeah. has been your experience? Yeah, so um, thankfully over COVID, we have been able to keep the, 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 the work on the ground going because our, our model is to, to, we're keeping our operation very slim here, but most of the people we work with are, are there and we're funding our own teams there or working with partners there. So that work was able to continue because there wasn't sort of travel bans. Um, but it hit really that we saw in two ways, one, and it all came down really to money. One was the tourism immediately stopped across Africa, and so much of that money goes into protecting the wildlife. And there was a huge uptick in poaching. 
uh, on many species, especially for giraffe. Huge. So we lost a lot of wildlife there, uh, unfortunately. The other part was that donations dried up because, you know, people who were philanthropists, you know, there was so much uncertainty, they sort of held back a little bit. Or because they saw the suffering on their own doorstep, they said, we need to help out in this COVID crisis in our own communities. So there was a double whammy there that the tourism money dried up and then all the co conservation money dried up, which as a function of philanthropy across all spectra is a very tiny percentage. I think it's only less than 1% of all philanthropy put together. Um, so that was a really, really hard. We lost a lot of, a lot of wildlife. Yeah. Um, so we we are we are funded by donations. We're we're a 501c3 um, charity. Thankfully, the founders have the means to cover our overhead in the U.S. Uh, so my salary, my travel is covered, uh, so that no donations go to that. So all donations that come in go 100% to the operations in, in in the field. And we're up to about over 20 projects now across nine countries. Um, so yeah, it's, that's another, I, I have to spend a lot of my time trying to, <laughs> to ask people for, for help because ultimately we're in this together. I can't do any of this if we don't have the funds. Um, so it, it comes from people who, who have the means or are generous and able to, able to, to help out, yeah. Are there political, I, I think in South Sudan there are all kinds of political problems. Did yeah. that interfere with your work? Uh, thankfully it doesn't in a way because um, it, it, it interferes in the way of trying to get into the country uh, because oftentimes in those situations there's a high corruption or it's a real pain to get in in terms of paperwork. But when it comes to these, South Sudan for instance or things like that, people are too busy fighting people and they don't, we just operate under the radar because we're only working with the wildlife. So we're not really harming anyone. We don't have a lot of money. So, you know, it's not like we're interrupting what they're sort of interested in. So sometimes I think in these conflict areas, I mean, there is a bit of danger to us, but our local teams know where the fighting is and where it isn't. So um, it doesn't affect our work that way. Sometimes there's an opportunity because no, no one else is investing in those areas, and that's where we try to some ways invest in, wisely, not, not frivolously. But in the case of South Sudan, the, the legacy of the wars, there's so many guns. So everyone has guns. I mean, walking around with AKs, with all these, you know, the M16s that they used to be called. And some of the younger guys especially have these guns, they have the bullets, so they start taking target practice. Or they'll have competitions amongst themselves. Who can kill a giraffe? Who can kill from what distance? You know, and they don't even use the animal. Um, so that's some of the legacy that comes out of it. But we're, thankfully, so far, we're able to kind of operate in these areas, uh, kind of under the radar, as it were. Do we have any one more question? Who pays your team? Uh, pardon? Who pays your team? So, uh, uh, pay, in terms of that, it, it comes from our, our donations, and then we transfer the funds to those countries, and then usually we we'll either pay them directly ourselves, or we work with a local partner uh, that then sort of officially hires them, and then we cover all their their funds. Yeah, but it all comes from from philanthropy and donations, 100 percent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'd like to say thank you so much for thank an you. excellent talk and for teaching us a lot of new things about your app. Oh. <laughs> and I'd like to present you with a oh, goodness. from the Explorers Club. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for, for coming. Thank you. And yeah. you said uh, people can contact you if they have any more. Questions. Yeah, please. If you have any questions or want to talk, please feel free to contact me. My cards are outside, too, if you want to grab one. Uh, and again, thank you all for coming out during the season and, and during COVID. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Also, uh, try and check out for next week. I think we have a talk on uh, Norwegian sailors. Uh, so check out the website for that information as well. Thank you. Oh, yes. Do you want to be able to do that? Do you want to be able to do that?